What words? In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. And what notes? In the beginning of this awesome musical version, Haydn created one of the supreme music dramatizations of all time, the depiction of chaos, as he entitled it, that pre-terrestrial chaos depicted in Genesis by the single line, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. This musical depiction is of a beauty almost frightening in its chromatic and dissonant texture, something outside of time and certainly outside of the 1790s when it was written. Then God said, let there be light. This in hushed mystical choral whispers, and there was light, a burst of unforgettable C major that is both primeval and eternal. As I was preparing this life-giving work one month ago in Connecticut, in a month of May so miraculously beautiful and abundant that it felt like Genesis all over again, I chanced upon a reprint in the New York Times of the great Nobel Prize speech made in 1975 by Andrei Sakharov, and I was struck by the extraordinary relevance of these words. Quote, an infinite number of other civilizations than ours may exist on the preceding and following pages of the book of the universe. Yet we should not minimize our sacred endeavors in this world where like faint glimmers in the dark, we have emerged for a moment from the dark chaos of unconscious matter in order to fulfill the demands of reason and to create a life worthy of ourselves and of the goals we only dimly perceive. End quote and amen. There are two different stories in Genesis about the creation of man and somewhat contradictory. The first is in chapter one. So God created man in his own image, male and female created he them. But in chapter two, we are told otherwise, that he created Adam alone. And then, almost as an afterthought, he performed the famous rib operation that provided Adam with a help meet. I personally prefer the second version because it gives Adam some quality, namely, loneliness, which is so human. Imagine all around him lived a happy animal world constituted in pairs, couples, all of whom Adam had also had the honor of naming. Furthermore, they had all received a special blessing from the Lord to be fruitful and multiply. Only Adam himself was uncoupled, hence incomplete, therefore envious, therefore lonely. So God, in his compassion, gave him a buddy, a mate, just like cows, horses, birds, whales, and so on. But this double creature was not meant to be cattle or whales. It, or they, or he, she, had God's personal touch and image conferred by the divine breath. Therefore, it was inevitable that they would seek knowledge, as our Faustian tradition repeatedly informs us. We can't help it. We've got to taste that apple. So here we are, millennia later, full of knowledge and sin and nuclear radiation. We have learned big secrets but not quite big enough to avoid planetary suicide. Today, as we are singing the praises of our creation and our creator, we are only a few weeks away from the dark cloud of Chernobyl 
and who knows how many weeks or months or years away from how many other Chernobyls we don't even know about. We don't know about them. Maybe somebody knows, but we don't. We don't know the extent to which we may already have poisoned our beloved earth. Every bird and bee and blade of grass, any and every species, starting with our own. This we do not know. What good then is all the great knowledge we have gained from our Faustian searches and researches, from all those apples we've been biting on since that serpentine Satan first tempted our first lady. It seems very clear to me on this glorious June Sunday afternoon, bathed by the special light of these Baroque windows, breathing the balmy air of southern Germany and feasting our eyes on this sacred architectural glory, it seems clear to me that there is a further knowledge we must now pursue, a life and death knowledge, the cognitive antidote to that paradisiac apple poison. And that knowledge is how to control the knowledge we already have. Otherwise, we could be headed for darkness, dead darkness. So we must insist with God that there be light, however religious or irreligious or agnostic or heretical we may be, that is one basic word of God to which we all must hold fast for our very lives. Enlightenment does itself mean knowledge, true, but for us now, it must mean most specifically the knowledge of how to contain what we already know. And we must learn all this fast, as fast as the flight of protons and neutrons. Meanwhile, the third part of Haydn's creation, now coming up, is not fast and a good thing, too, for it gives us time to remember and rejoice in the purity and grace and fortitude of nature, to saunter blissfully through that garden of gardens along with Adam and Eve, to restore our souls, to recover our moral strength, and to rediscover our power to praise.